Have you wondered about a special class of materials described as rate dependent materials? And these are materials that their properties change depending on the loading speed that you subject them to. That's what we're going to focus on this video, especially on how to generate tensile properties from these rate dependent materials. Let's sit back and relax as we get started with this video. So as we start, I want to introduce to you this young man called Dr. Brian. He's a postdoctoral researcher that works within a university and he's grappling with this challenge of to investigate the high rate behavior of a rate dependent material, in this case, a sort of plastic. And he's unsure about how to go about doing this. And so this is what we're going to help him with in this video to guide him through the process in choosing the right kind of experiments for rate dependent materials. Traditionally, when you want to do an experiment, you've got a specimen and then you want to generate a stress strain response ultimately from that experiment and with this stress strain response you can based on the elastic region generate the young smooth loose and based on the ultimate tensile stress find the yield stress or the ten, uh, the, the fat fracture behavior of this material and other cons other issues associated with this but this is usually done within a laboratory environment using a universal tensile that's the machine and it's quite straightforward to do this but the challenge is when do you want to then investigate high rate behavior what do you need to do and this is important because when you consider this particular work which is published by Gellac and 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 Sivio and Petronic, you know, in many years many years ago. And what we were looking at in this work is a tensile behavior of a grade of epoxy resin used in composite in designing of composites, and it's called the RTM six. And what you see here is the true stress strain response of these materials. And one of the things you instantly note is that there is a changing strain rate, which is the speed of loading. And with this increase in strain rate, something begins to happen. What you notice is that the strength of this material also would increase depending on the increasing strain rate. So for example, around here, it's just under 100 megapascal. And then at a strain rate of 80 is around 125 and then beyond. Uh, at strain rate of 1700, you get just around 175 and so on and so forth. So certainly the strain rate is increasing and so the strength of this material, this same rate dependent material is also increasing. The other thing you'll notice with here is also the fact that the increasing strain rate leads also decrease in the failure strain of this material. So initially the failure strain was just over 10% here, now it's got around 10% and at this point it's about 4% and still around 4%. So decreasing st fracture strain is corresponding with increasing strain rate. And so this type of materials are described as rate dependent material. And so it's important for us to find the right kind of experiment to investigate this dynamic response. In this low strain rate region, a universal tensile estimation will be useful for that. However, in the super high strain rate region, a new type of experiment will be required in doing that. And that's what we're going to be looking at further. Now, the classic equipment for doing this is called something called a split Hawkinson pressure bar. And there is a classic design to this split Hawkinson pressure bar. And that's what we see here in this video. And the principle really is that you have a gas gun, which is pressurized, and then it fires, it releases pressure that projects this striker bar. And this striker, which is basically a piece of metal, impact on the incident bar and then the incident bar hits the specimen that is here and then there is a transmission bar or an output bar that also you know sort of gets some part of the stress wave through the specimen into the transmission bar and there is a support all these are held in this way so this is a classic design of a classic split Hawkinson pressure bar of course to track the stress wave that travels through the incident and transmission bar you need the strain gauges that are attached at this point to harvest that because that's the basis upon which you're going to com compute your stresses and your strain on, on that material. And then also, in some cases, you may have to have a, a camera to visualize what is happening at this dynamic rate because the speed of testing means that you can't visually see what's happening, you know. So you need some kind of high rate camera, high speed camera to visualize what's going on. So in some cases, people use this to visualize the, the behavior. But the key thing you will see in this sort of classic Lee Hopkinson pressure bar is that the specimen right in the middle here will undergo a kind of compressive behavior. So the incident bar 
crushes on the specimen and then some transmission go onto the transmission bar. Now, this is just an example of a copper specimen that has been tested with the same thing. So we've got the incident bar, we've got the specimen which is a copper specimen here, and then a transmitter bar or a output bar, whatever name you, you tend to. So the key thing is that the system is in compression. So in terms of investigating the behavior of the system, you have to subject it to a compressive behavior. But what Brian really wants is to look at this behavior in a tensile response. Because yes, a split Hopkinson bar is good, but it's essentially the classic design is for compression, but he's interested in a tensile behavior. So what else would he need to consider? Again, this team, Gellack and his colleagues Petronik at Oxford University, they came up with a new design, a modified tensile split Hopkinson pressure bar that is fantastic in imposing a tensile deformation on a material. And I'll just walk you through what is going on here. So again, remember previously we talked about the input bar. So the input bar is green here and this grayish brownish bar is the output bar or the transmitter bar or whatever name you tend to call it. We've got a strain gauge on the transmitter bar and two strain gauges on also the input bar. Now, right in the middle here, we've got a tensile specimen, a classic dog bone tensile specimen that is wedged right in the middle there. And so what we want with this tensile specimen is so that it will, it will be subjected to a tensile pool so that it can actually test the specimen in, in tension. However, the classic design of a split Hawkinson bar is always in compression. So without some modification, what you'll notice is that this bit will be compressing that bit and you don't want that. And so this modified design is really very intelligent in the sense that we have another loading bar, a much longer loading bar, you know, at this end, and it's a house inside a piston cylindrical chamber. And what would happen is that this system inside here has a high pressure, and that high pressure, when it releases, it projects, it propels this cylindrical bar, travels at quite a high velocity, hits on this impact flange, and when it hits on the impact flange, because it's connected to the output bar, the output bar is forced to go backwards. And as a result, you end up with a tensile pool on the sample. So this is the modification that this team, you know, Gellack and his colleagues, and it's become quite common, you know, to have this sort of design. There are different variants of this. You just need to look into Google Scholar to explore and find people that are working with modified tensile test specimen. But one of the challenges with this is that you need to create this extra compartment. It is a different setup from a classic design of a split Hawkinson pressure bar. So if you're going to then test the material in compression and intention, you need both. Your compression classic design and then a tensile design. You can't just interconvert them. And now how is the specimen held in place with this modified design? So one of the things that Brian need to consider is a close-up image here showing you the input bar with the strain gauges attached, which is input one and two, and the output bar here. And right in the middle there, we get the tensile specimen. That tensile specimen will have some kind of end caps that you need to use in securely fixing it into the output and input bar. So the input bar will be threaded and then you screw the sample into that, getting it securely fixed so that when the impact load comes, you can then experience the tensile deformation. And this is a typical picture showing, you know, something overall length of 70 millimeters. And right in the middle region here, you've got the, the dog bone specimen. And these are end caps, you know, steel end caps that have been screwed onto the sample, bolted onto the sample, ready for it to be subjected to a tensile. Now, the dimensions of a typical dog bone specimen will, that we could use will look like this. It's slightly different from what the standards say. If you use the ASTM standard, for example, those specimens are too big for a split Hopkinson pressure bar. So you really need a small size specimen. And so these are the type of specimens. Overall length of 7 cm and the thickness of 1 cm. And the gauge section that is very, very small. And this is sort of what you're going to use to that pool. Now, there is also another design that Brian can use. And this is something that's published, you know, in 2007. It's quite an old paper by this guy, Moore and Gary. And they come up with what they call an M-shaped tensile specimen. And it's really very interesting because it wouldn't require you to go and modify the existing split Hopkinson pressure bar. You can use your compression split Hopkinson pressure bar. However, when the sample is tested, it will experience a tensile deformation. And so this is a class, a close-up image showing what is going on here. So we've got the normal input bar, incident bar, and the transmitter bar. So, and right here in the middle, we get the M specimen, the M-shaped specimen, with some kind of spacer in between, which we're going to talk about later on. Spacers in between, and then a base frame where the whole assembly will need to rest. 
So the idea here is that when the incident bar is impacting on this M-shaped specimen, the transmitter bar will receive the signals. And so now this is what we have. So let's look a little bit more at what is going on here. Now this is the design of this M-shaped specimen. So it's got this classic design and this region look a little bit more like a tensile, dog bone tensile specimen, a dog bone tensile specimen. And so what you want to do is that by the time you impact on the sample here and it's coming down, it will cause this region to stretch out, that region to stretch out as well. And then because this other end is anchored, you experience a tensile deformation. So this is really an innovative design of a specimen that you could use to impose a tensile deformation on your sample, even though the sample is going to be experiencing a compressive deformation, the classic design of a speak of Simba. And this is fantastic in the sense that you don't then have to modify your design of a split Hopkinson pressure bar. You can use a classic design with this M-shaped specimen and then you get your behavior. So the dimensions, the typical dimensions you can use is something that looks like this. Of course, a split Hopkinson pressure bar usually requires small size specimen. And so the overall dimension of this specimen is not very big. So the challenge with the M-shaped specimen is mentioning it into these dimensions. So that's just a quick video to point out to you two different specimen designs that you can use to investigate the tensile deformation at high rates of an engineering material that shows great dependent behavior. If you're interested in on, on seeing how the geometry of the m shell specimen is created, then look at this video. If you're interested in the geometry of the tensile specimen, how it's created within the Split Hopkinson assembly, then look at this video and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.